So we're now going to look at a correct proof for the chain rule. The approach we're taking is uh, an all-in proof where we use epsilon delta definition of the limit to a high degree. So first of all, let's remind ourselves what the chain rule says. It says that d dx of f of g of x is equal to the derivative of f evaluated at g of x and then g prime x, like this. What are the assumptions? f is differentiable at, well, let's call the variable of f u, so u equals to g of x and g differentiable at x. These are my assumptions. So all in all, this should give me this formula here. So the problem in the fake proof was that we divided by g of x plus h minus g of x when we wanted this expression here to appear in the proof. And this expression here is what gives us this. And the problem was to get this guy here, I needed to multiply and divide by this difference here. And this difference here can be zero even if h is non-zero. So that was the problem. We're not allowed to divide by this. So how to avoid this? Well, we begin this proof by making an observation. And this observation is crucial. So we take this fact here and we write out what it means. Well, in terms of the limit, it means that lim, um, and now let's give some names here to the various variables. So we have x here on one axis. This is where g takes its input. g sends stuff to where f takes its input. And this would be the u values here. And then f sends these guys to the y-axis. And then when we move to the side here, we're, let's, let us add by h, okay? As we usually do when we take the derivative. But when we move u to the side here, if we move him independently or dependently on this, let's use the letter k here. So when I write the derivative of f, let me write him as u plus k minus f of u, and then divided by k here, k goes to zero. So k is not an integer here, k is supposed to be a, a small real number, uh, same way as h is, okay? So we, we know that this guy here exists when u is equal to this choice here. What does this mean? Well, this means that for every epsilon bigger than zero, and now we're, we're going to have a lot of epsilons appearing in this proof. So let's call this epsilon one. There exists a delta one such that when k is less than delta one in absolute value, and k is non zero, this implies that f of u plus k minus f of u divided by k minus f prime of u is less than, is less than epsilon one. Now here we can multiply by the absolute value of k on both sides. So then this becomes the following, like this. And the observation is now that since this implies this and this implies this, then certainly this implies this. So here, of course, I need k to be non-zero, so I just repeat what I write here. But if I now do this, what happens then? Well, clearly this implies this implies this, that's still true. So this implies this, but Notice now, what if k is equal to zero? Well, if k is equal to zero, this is equal to zero. And if k is equal to zero, this guy is equal to zero. And if k is equal to zero, this thing here is just f of u. So you have f of u minus f of u. So when k is equal to zero, this is fine. So here I can remove that restriction. And in a sense, by doing this, I have found the key of how to solve the problem of dividing by zero. So I move this guy up, that's the point. Now let's see how to use this observation here. So let us now elaborate a little bit more on him, but in order to understand what we need to do, let us first write down what we wanna prove. So we wanna prove this, okay? So let's write out that out in epsilon delta, what that means. So it's the first step. So let's go a little bit down here. So I want to prove that lim h tends towards zero of f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x divided by h is equal to f prime at g of x and then g prime x, okay? This means we want to prove for all epsilon. And now this is our main epsilon, so let's make him green or something. There exists a delta, and let's make this delta green, such that h smaller than delta implies f g of x plus h minus f of g of x divided by h 
minus this thing here, less than epsilon. So this is what I want to prove. And let's now try to compare these expressions here. So here we have uh, the expression involved in proving the that the derivative of f at u uh, exists. And here we have the expression for proving that the derivative of f of g of x exists at x, okay? Notice here. So here I'm having this point instead of f minus this thing here, okay? So I'm, I'm looking at these two things. In terms of this figure here, this means that moving, say, here to x plus h results in a movement up here between where we compare the value of f at g of x and at g of x plus h. So what would my k be then? Well, my k should be the difference between these two things. So let's now check here. So if I put k equals to g of x plus h minus g of x, so I'm free to put whatever k I want here, as long as it's small. So now let's make this choice of k, and let's afterwards argue that it's small, okay? But if I put this expression, what does this become? Well, here I'm getting u plus k. And let's check here what happens. So u plus k, who was u? u was g of x, and who was k? k is this, so this is just g of x plus h, since this and this cancels. So by making this choice for k, this thing here becomes this thing here. And now as u was g of x, I'm getting this thing, and here I'm having this thing here, and now k, I don't know if, if we should write it out. Well, let's do it. We can see what's going on like this, and then less than or equal to epsilon one times this difference here, okay? So this holds if this thing here is less than delta one. But how to get this less than delta one? Well, so notice the following. So g differentiable at x, so we already know this implies g continuous at x. But this means that if I put here a number that's really, really close to x, then this thing here will be small. What does that mean? Well, in terms of the epsilon deltas, it means that for every epsilon two, let's say, there exists a delta two such that when, let's call it x two minus x is less than delta two, this implies g of x two minus g of x less than epsilon two. Now, now I can apply this definition here with epsilon two equals to delta one. So this means there exists a delta two, so that if I put x two close enough to x, I'll get this smaller than delta one. And here, if I now choose x two to be x plus h, this difference here is then just h. This means that I now know that if I place here delta one, I get the existence of a delta two, such that if h is smaller than delta two, this difference here is smaller than delta one. Meaning here that I get that if h is smaller than delta two, this implies that this is smaller than delta one, which implies this. So all in all, what I can do now, is I can erase this part here, never think of it again, and instead write this to get things clean. Let's also remove this. So now I know there exists delta two such that this happens. All right. So this will be a crucial ingredient in the argument that follows uh, for any epsilon one. Let's, let's put that as well. Okay. Now let's move down here. So now we're looking at this expression here and we want to get this guy small. What I have up here is a tool, but it's not the only tool I need. But let's see if we can make this thing appear down here. So when we have these epsilon delta proofs, we're challenged with an epsilon, we need to find the delta. This is what we need to study. This is what we need to try to compute and to find some chain of equalities and inequalities so that we show that we're smaller than this arbitrary epsilon. And of course, this epsilon here that we're challenged with, we should consider him as being concrete. And we can let epsilon one be equals to this green one, or we can let epsilon one be equal to half of this guy or something else. And please note that here, X is all the time fixed. X will never move. So this epsilon one here, we can also depend on, on X since he's not our variable. Who is our variable? H, H is our variable. So the epsilons are not allowed to depend on H. So what do we do? Well, as I said, so we look at this guy here. 
so we compute. So let's start here, so we have some space. So we have this guy. We want to compare him to this guy. And here, a, a smart thing to do, or a good thing to do, is to add by zero in the following way. So we subtract this term here, where we insert the definition of this guy here, in a sense. So we keep this guy, and then here we put g of x plus h, minus g of x divided by h. And then we add the same guy, and we subtract him. Okay. And I don't insert my epsilon here, okay? So I want to work with this expression and get a chain of equalities and inequalities that in the end leads me to um, this expression being smaller than my epsilon here, my green epsilon. Well, maybe I should call this thing here star. So what I've shown here first is that star is equal to this thing. And now I can apply the triangle inequality, putting absolute value signs here and here. What next? Well, let's look up here. So the thing I have here is now exactly the thing I have here, except I'm dividing by ages here. But this age, I can move to the outside. So I can move my age here. It becomes like this, this, then I should put a parenthesis here, right? And now I can apply this, right? So I know that whatever epsilon I want to challenge myself with, I can find the delta two such that yada, yada, yada. So now I say that this holds here. If age is less than delta two, and then well, let's remind ourselves, then I get here one over age, or rather I get epsilon one. So from this times g of x plus h minus g of x, and then divided by h here. And h was an absolute value, but oh, this guy here needs to be an absolute value. And this is an absolute value too. So all of this is an absolute value. And now this thing here, let's look at him. Here I have this factor on both sides. I can move it out. So this is just a fixed number because g is because x is fixed. And what remains here, g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h minus g prime at x. Okay. Next, so we have a couple of things going on here. So first of all, we know that g is differentiable at x. So we know that when h is small, this thing here will approach that thing. And let me not write out the epsilon delta definition of that, but let us just observe that this thing here, we can make smaller than any epsilon. So let's call this epsilon three now. If h is smaller than some appropriate delta, let's call that delta three. So we get that inequality if h is smaller than delta three. So when we write the next line here, we're going to use this and then impose also that h is smaller than delta three. Some number, depending on whatever we want to put here. What about this guy here? Well, this guy here approaches g prime of x. So we can actually write him as g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h and then write minus g prime here, and then we add g prime of x here, like this. Now I use the triangle inequality, and I put absolute values here. And now this is just a constant, because x is not moving, so this is just a number. What about this? Well, this I can get small by making h small. It's exactly that guy, right? So I can say that, well, by putting this condition here, I can get him smaller than epsilon three. But that makes this expression slightly more complicated than we want. We'll have epsilon one times epsilon three plus this thing here. All we need to know here, or a crucial thing to observe is that we have the power to make epsilon one as small as we want. So as soon as this doesn't get huge, all of this term here will be small without this guy having to be small himself. So here, let's just impose an extra delta condition and say that, well, this guy here will be smaller than one. So not that guy, but this guy here will be smaller than one if h is smaller than some delta four. So moving down here, let's move this thing a little further down. Then if I now impose this delta condition and this delta condition, I know that this thing here is smaller than epsilon one, and then one plus uh, g prime x in absolute value. And here I have this guy. And here I have epsilon three. Let's put epsilon three here just to make it tidy. Okay. Now what? 
Well, now I'm in complete control and I'm about to win this thing. I can choose my epsilon ones and epsilon threes to be whatever I want as long as they're constant. And in the context of this proof, being constant means not depending on h, or not depending on anything depending on h. So if I now want all of this to be smaller than my green epsilon, what do I need to do? Well, I need this, for instance, to be smaller than epsilon half and this to be smaller than epsilon half. So here it's enough if I choose epsilon one to be equal to green epsilon divided by two times one plus the absolute value of g prime x. And notice I'm, there's no chance I'm dividing by something that's zero here since um, this guy cannot be negative, so we cannot kill this. And furthermore, I want epsilon three to be equal to green epsilon divided by two times f prime g of x. Now here I'm at a slight risk because what if this thing is zero? Well, if this thing is zero, then all, all of this term is zero. So I don't need to make a choice for epsilon three at all. Or I can add a one here. Anyway, we have one and that's it. Because now, um, well, what's my choice for delta here? or green delta. So my choice for green delta is the smallest of, let's see here, of delta two, delta three, and delta four. And we are done because now we've proven this uh, implication here, which is by definition proving that this limit here holds. Yay. And all we've used in this proof is that f is differentiable at g of x, that g is differentiable at x.